Thank you very much for the introduction. It's great to be here this evening and to see a mixed audience indeed um, in terms of ages. So in terms of the outline of uh, this evening's talk, I'd like to review some of the themes of ageing. In particular, if we say that there's early adulthood, there's middle adulthood, there's late adulthood, the third phase of life, I suppose, is late adulthood. Um, I want to actually put it to you that there are three subdivisions within that third phase of later adulthood. I want to focus a little bit on negative stereotyping, fear and denial, um, things that I suppose really influence our perception of our growing old. I also want to ask, are there opportunities in the midst of, of change and loss in later life? It's not all about decay and decline. So we want to focus on that and try and be a bit more grounded and positive, hopefully. Uh, but positive for a reason, I believe. And in particular, the emphasis on this evening, I think, uh, is skills and strategies. Um, we don't prepare for any endeavour in life without considerable degree of training, preparation, tuition, uh, hard work, hard graft. But somehow when we reach our 65th birthday, the assumption that we continue learning just isn't there. And I want to shake that up a little bit and, and ask really what skills and strategies are useful in increasing the likelihood that later life will be actually a very rewarding and positive experience. So that's what I hope to cover uh, this evening. So what is old age? Um, it's a moot point. It's a good question. You could be cynical and say it's whenever the law of diminishing returns uh, kicks in, whenever it's kind of more you know, more negatives, more minuses than pluses. Um, it's, it's a subject of considerable debate and it depends entirely on your perspective and indeed your age. If you ask a 20 year old what is old, they will say it's 30 or 40. You know, if you ask someone who's 60 or 70 what is old, they'll probably say, well, it's 10 years older than me. Thank you very much. But it's, it's arbitrary and it's a major social challenge in terms of characterizing the beginning of the ageing process. Uh, it's quite arbitrarily chosen, very often chosen for service provision or administrative reasons. Is it down to major milestones like getting your pension or getting your P45 from your regular employment or getting your bus pass through the post? All these can come confront us quite suddenly. Um, is it 60? Is it 65? Or is it 70? Well, very few people would probably say that 60 is the start of old age. People would say it's the youth of old age, perhaps. 65, 66, that's when we con you know, conventionally retire. Or is it 70? Um, that may be more realistic, really. Uh, interestingly, when you ask men um, at 65 and women at 65, when they say later life starts, men will say it's 62 and women will say it's 66. Now, aging implies a number of processes, and as human beings, we are undoubtedly biological organisms, but we're more than that. We have, a, a, I suppose, a psychological makeup, and we exist in a cultural context. And enormous variability and heterogeneity exists amongst people that we say are 65 and older. We really cannot generalize them, generalize about them as one single homogenous group that we can conveniently tar with a, a single brush. That, that just isn't possible. There's no doubt that whatever a person does, thinks and feels, and the interactions with the environment are crucial for the nature and experience uh, of old age. There's no doubt it's catching on. It's becoming a bit more popular. There's certainly an increase in life expectancy globally, and it's predicted, for example, by 2050, that we will have an extra 10 years added to life expectancy. You hear all these figures quoted all the time. I think what's really startling is how much we have achieved. Uh, we have to recall that the average life expectancy in one developed country, namely the US, you know, around 1900 was a little over 50. So we've nearly added 30 years of extra longevity on average in the 20th century. Some people would say longevity is the only achievement of the 20th century. You know, we've had world wars, Holocaust, new words added to the human vocabulary. But longevity is something probably that we don't acknowledge and celebrate enough, I think. In terms of raw numbers or absolute numbers of older people, um, in the year 2000, there were about 600 million people on the planet aged 65 and older, projected to rise to 2 billion uh, by, by 2050. Now, in, in some societies, that's a complex picture because in some societies in the West, in some countries like Italy, France, perhaps, Germany, perhaps, Japan, 
you know, uh, the, the, the birth rate is declining. So that distorts the population perhaps um, in, in favour of, of older people. We're getting to the stage basically when we're near the 30-30 era, whereby you work for 30 years and then you have a retirement that lasts 30 years. So that's quite a, an exciting prospect, I think. Uh, remember, again, if we look at 1900, you know, at the peak of maybe the Industrial Revolution, you know, the average retirement lasted maybe up to two to three years. Um, you know, people got a pretty miserable dispatch uh, in later life. So what are we doing with that extra longevity? Um, is healthy life expectancy increasing? I think the evidence seems to point in the, the, towards the answer that it is. And certainly enhancing longevity is an absolute priority. It's a terrible old cliche, isn't it, to talk about, you know, life to years and years to life. Um, I think we probably are adding more uh, life to years in that we're hopefully compressing uh, morbidity. We don't want a situation whereby people are living longer to be sicker longer with the poorer quality of life. I think the evidence is, is that we're actually compressing morbidity and people are having fuller, healthier lives. Um, just to look at some figures um, from an Irish context. So what is the current life expectancy at birth right now in this country? For a female it's 83, for a male it's 79 in this country. Globally, uh, for a male it's 68, for a female uh, it's 73. So that might surprise people that we are seeing an increasing life expectancy right across the planet. Societies and different continents from, from you know, sub-Saharan Africa to Latin America to Asia particularly are seeing large numbers, large rises in the numbers of older people for the first time in their history and that poses their health services at times, you know, severe challenges. In the West basically, if you make it to 75, on average you can expect to live 12 more years. Um, and a baby born in the UK in 2011 is eight times more likely to become a centenarian than one born in 1931. So those, you know, statistics are, are reassuring and comforting. They're creeping upwards all the time. Will it inevitably continue on an upward tra trajectory with factors like Western diet, you know, prevalence of diabetes and other vascular conditions? I don't really know. I don't think we can guarantee that. I don't think we can take, you know, increasing longevity inevitably, inexorably as a, as a given by any manner or means. So let's look at successful ageing. So the idea that ageing was a positive thing is relatively new in psychological and sociological literature. And really since the 1960s, the themes of activity and continuity were endorsed by academics as being good, as being useful, as being something that should be translated to a broader population to challenge the inevitable decline that does accompany um, the, the life cycle as we get older. It was two academics, Rowe and Kahn in 1998, who coined the term successful ageing, basically denoting living to very old age with good quality of life, shaping how people expect to grow old. The problem with that concept is that it only applies to one in ten of us because it excludes people who have real lives, who get sick, who get ill, who get infirm and who get disabled. There are other terms that are sometimes used interchangeably like positive ageing or active ageing and again these are psychological constructs to describe an actively cultivated sense of well-being despite the problems that are associated with later life. So we can have, we can allow for that bit of disability or chronic medical condition and not dismiss people as unsuccessful agers which I think is very important. So the concept of successful ageing has its critics. Is it useful? And if we're saying that people age well and we champion those and they are good role models and good examples for us and we want to emulate them, what about the people who don't age well or who through no fault of their own become sick or infirm? Are they at risk of being ignored? Are we at risk of just dismissing them and creating basically kind of a two-tier system of ageing where the needs of some people are just discounted? So um, measuring ageing, as, as we've seen, focuses on a lot on performance and disease criteria, uh, ignoring personal individual values of successful ageing. And people will have their own views about changes and developments that have happened, ways they feel about themselves, 
um, that don't necessarily involve any reflection on joint pain or stiffness or mobility difficulties. They more may point to spiritual growth, to wisdom and so on as being really rich opportunities of ageing. And we need to take those views into account in saying whether or not someone is ageing successfully or not. There's no doubt that successful ageing, however we view it or whatever term we use, is encouraged by modern society. Liberal society will say it's a very good thing. The problem is though that the opportunities to get there are pretty narrow. If for example you're a teacher, a retired teacher, and you want to go back into the classroom and volunteer for a half day and give of all your experience and you will have hopefully a renewed burst of enthusiasm freed from the, the strictures of a nine to five job, but you want to go back and give something back, have you the opportunity to do it? I don't think so you'll be met with all sorts of policies and restrictions and barriers. So although we're saying successful ageing is a good thing, I think actually the opportunities to achieve it are not that plentiful. So another con criticism I think of successful ageing is the, the view that it's all down to us, that we choose the type of later life that, that we actually experience. And that may not be the case because sometimes through no fault of our own, we have a genetic lottery, a hand of cards that we can't change and genes interact with different environments. And unfortunately, we may get sick and that can lead to an exaggerated sense of self-blame. So um, again, that doesn't mean people have been unsuccessful in, in their ageing. So there are criticisms of this notion of successful versus unsuccessful ageing. So stages of ageing. I just want to look at that. You may recognise the two gentlemen on the, the screen there. The one on your left is Eric Erickson, the guy who's looking very straight at the camera, analysing the camera, glaring it down. Poor photographer. That's, of course, Sigmund Freud. And these individuals had some impact, certainly, on stages of ageing. Psychological theories of ageing and human development have certainly been more influenced by Eric Erickson than Sigmund Freud. Freud said a number of terrible things in his career. One of the things he said was that the Irish are the only race that cannot benefit from psychoanalysis. That's what he said. Now at the rates he was charging, I think probably people were a bit timid about asking what he meant by that. But another thing he said, which was pretty terrible, was near around the age of 50, the elasticity of the mental processes is lacking. Older people are no longer educable. That's pretty insulting, isn't it? And unfortunately, that stuck a little bit. You know, that probably deterred a lot of psychological research, a lot of clinical interest in the welfare and concerns of, of older people. Ericsson, I think, was much more uh, humane about all of this and, and, and certainly on the mark when he believed that maturation was ongoing. And we all instinctively know that. None of us are the same person entirely, you know, five years ago versus 10 years ago. We all grow and evolve and, and develop and so on, even through setbacks. And Ericsson believed, as you know, that various stages in life uh, were based on working through a series of crises. And he believed that the conflict in later life was this crisis of integrity versus despair. And Ericsson believed that a particularly important event in life was reflection and feeling fulfillment. And if you successfully navigated that crisis, you could certainly experience and know what wisdom meant. Whereas if you didn't, if you didn't navigate that, that could lead to regret, despair, and certainly, obviously, clinical depression. Fiche Blinik Foss, who remembers this? Any offers about the author? Who? Very good, very good, very good. Thank you. I didn't actually know. I was just checking uh, if anyone knew. I just remember that ringing in my ears from, you know, from school. 20 years of growing, 20 years good, 20 years declining, and 20 years useless. Pretty bleak, isn't it? But then literary, literature and you know, mythology is full of bleak references to the ageing process. So let's look at that third age then, what would be referred to in kind of Peg Sayre's literary tradition as kind of 20 years declining. Um, well, is it the case? Is decline uh, the marker of that, that stage in the life cycle? I would argue there are three sub-stages in the third age. The first is the, 50, the decades of your 50s and 60s, which research seems to indicate are, are actually the happiest years of the human life cycle. Um, 
there may be many reasons for that. Your career may be established. Your kids may be older. You may have, I suppose, released, been released from some of the responsibilities of earlier, busier years. But the problem is the future is no longer spacious. People say that you really begin to think about death really after the age of 50, when you're firmly beyond that middle midlife phase. But despite that, despite this existential warnings, actually research does show that those decades, 50s and 60s, are actually quite happy years, or potentially can be. Into the 70s then, what happens? Well, happiness continues, particularly for those who have good physical health. And certainly a lot of people will have shed a lot of burden, maybe by their 70s, will be more comfortable in their skin, they will have more freedom. And people can still be very vigorous, active, productive, and so on. Into the 80s, it may get a little bit harder. It may get a bit more challenging. We need to work harder at keeping independence. We certainly need to work harder, perhaps, at keeping an open mind, experimenting, changing, challenging ourselves, and so on. But it's not all decline. What about fear of ageing? Um, if we take this very, very bleak and negative view of the ageing process, certainly if we look at these statistics and we think about the demographics and we think about this age quake, as it's also called, or a silver tsunami, you know, ready to engulf us, predicting drain on resources, predicting a massive explosion in the pension burden and fewer and fewer economically active younger adults to support older people, you would get pretty scared, wouldn't you? Um, but in fact, the reality is, look, it, it really hides that kind of a crude assumption, really hides the real monetary transfers that, that occur. And I know in my own clinical practice, hearing how older people uh, are the ones that are supporting the younger generation. They're the ones maybe, you know, doing informal child minding without any payment or any question of payment. They're the ones maybe paying school fees or dental bills or bailing out their kids, basically. And those are the real economic transfers that we actually see. What about ageism? And this may be an extension of negative stereotyping, negative views of older people. And ageism, is it an ism at all? Some people say it isn't because can you be really be prejudicial against your future self? After all, hopefully we are going to become old. But negative views of older people basically portray older people as helpless or depressed or ill or indeed unattractive unattractive. And if we look at the anti-aging market, the products, the volume of products, the value of products that are sold to beautify ourselves, globally it's been estima estimated that the anti-aging market is worth about 290 billion US dollars per year, or certainly it was in 2015. Now if you were saying that was an economy, that would probably be the size of, a, certainly bigger than our GDP in Ireland, you know, an economy the size of maybe Belgium or the Netherlands. So that's what we spend on hair dye, on potions, lotions, you know, and even formal cosmetic surgery procedures and so on. It's quite a lot, isn't it? So, age stereotypes um, are, are pretty abundant. You only have to buy a birthday card for someone over the age of 40 to know exactly what I mean by that. They're pretty uh, crude and, and humorous, aren't they? The problem is that it's worse than just bad humour. They can affect survival. Conversely, having a positive view of ageing can add up to seven and a half years in terms of your life expectancy, according to one researcher, researcher Levy, in 2002. So, is there something, is there, does it behove us to resist age stereotypes? I think it does. We can live time, basically, rather than trying to stop it. After all, as Eleanor Roosevelt says, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Death anxiety. Very common. I've mentioned it before. Maybe it starts from your 50s onwards. Maybe the, the Grim Reaper um, knocks on our door at an earlier age when we get sick or we're confronted with our own mortality. And we worry about death. And worrying about death is as futile as worrying about who will attend your funeral. Is it really death we fear? After all, we have to leave behind this worn out overcoat. And we do have to enter into this long sleep. And that's not something perhaps to be afraid, afraid of. Or is it more not knowing what or where is after death? If we can accept the inevitability of our dying, we can actually move beyond it and then we're free to live perhaps. But when death comes, above all, let it find us doing exactly what we want. We should call today our own and live for today 
and for the moment. And that's perhaps the best way to overcome uh, death anxiety. Not to be fidgeting and restless, but to be purposeful and active and remain engaged and committed. But we don't do that, do we, very well. We enter into denial. And how deep is the denial? The belief in perpetual youth, eternal life, and other dangerous fantasies. And people can take it to enormous extremes. People can even have their bodies frozen or even have their heads and brains frozen. As you know, these facilities exist around the world. So what is the most desirable age to be at? Well, it's zero age, not zero, but zero, particularly for females, I am told, is between 34 to 38. So that's the age that you kind of want to remain stuck at, according to beauticians and cosmetics exper experts. And the expenditure to remain at this age is pretty vast, as we've seen. And in Ireland, again, we have our own part to play in all of this. Allergan and Westport County Mayo make most of the world's Botox, which is valued at 1.3 billion US dollars annually for a global market. I don't know, did you know that? That's what Westport contributes. So we have a collective denial of the aging process. That's, that's certainly widespread. And humour is one of these potent tools to stereotype older people. And it's amazing how um, you know, we have this discomfort in our everyday lives. We have this discomfort about our language, about living amid death. How often do we use the, the term passed away or lost as opposed to die? or the phrase that's creeping in, the Americanism, he or she passed. What does that mean exactly? Is it an exam or is it a test of some court? I don't know. So the denial is pretty profound. I was scanning the popular media a while ago and I came across the Irish Independent uh, Experience and Encounter Supplement and I began reading it. And I liked initially what I saw. It talked about building and activities that blow away cobwebs, get out of your comfort zone, all very sensible advice that people of all ages could, could do with, learn a new fact every day, use the stairs, all very sound, useful, sensible advice. The problem was that a column like this degenerates into age disguising tips. So what they say is wear jeans, but the right ones, the right ones, whatever they are, I don't know, and ditch the hair bob. That's supposed to be particularly bad in terms of revealing your age. And of course, it's never too late to rescue your teeth. And you don't even have to, you can combine a holiday with it. Uh, you can go off to Eastern Europe and have it all done uh, on the cheap. And above all, listen to boy bands. So One Direction and Westlife, please reform, don't break up. We want you to, to salvage who we are and our self-image. So there's a bit of a dilemma going on. There's a contemporary view of ageing that old age is a period of disintegration, but one that potentially is delayed by diets, exercise, and maybe even in the future abolished by genetic manipulation. But in reality, is old age not like every other stage in life? It has its upsides and it has its downsides, both good and bad. I want to share with you a quote from Thomas Cole in 1992 from the book The Journey of Life, A Cultural History of Aging in America, and I think it's quite profound. Aging like illness and death reveals the most fundamental conflict of the human condition. The tension between infinite ambition, dreams and desires on the one hand, and vulnerable, decaying physical existence on the other. The tragic and ineradicable conflict between body and spirit. This paradox cannot be eradicated by the wonders of modern medicine or by positive attitudes towards growing old. So I think that's quite a humbling statement for all of us. We know, though, that later life in reality can be productive, can be healthy, can be full of vitality. <coughs> Old age does not have to be equated with death, disability and disease. We can alter our lifestyles even very later on in life and we can reap some health dividends from that and that can improve the quality of our life. So growing old essentially can be viewed both as a coming to a wholeness of soul and aging with zest despite the fact that our bodies no longer do our bidding. That may be the reality. Our bodies will let us down incrementally as we get a bit older. So we need to hold these contradictory views of ageing as being simultaneously both a time of meaning and a time of change, of spirituality and of sadness and of loss. 
and we need essentially to overcome, to move away from overcoming the inherent nature of old age, but to try and transcend its infirmities through our attitudes, our behaviour, and perhaps most difficult of all, through our social institutions. I want to focus now on the skills, though, that might be helpful, might be useful to us along that particular journey. What skills do we need to acquire to enable us to acknowledge the tough realities of ageing, but also to actively see its possibilities? And I want to share with you some thoughts about those skills now. Well, we may not bother. We may not want to acquire these skills. We may put our head in the sands. And as Judith Regan says, the key to successful ageing is to pay as little attention to it as possible. We can get away with it for a while. Our middle years will continue to expand. And some people say midlife has a particularly broad span, really from about 30, actually possibly up till about 70. But age catches up eventually. Our face can seem like a time bomb, ready to blow up at some moment to explode with the scars of ageing. And at some stage after 50 or 60 or 70, we realise our body is our mortal enemy. It may let us down sooner or later. Or we may become very preoccupied with our passing. We may escape a sudden crisis, but we may become filled with an anxiety about death. And a quote is, death is one of the things on the minds of older adults. They wonder how it'll come when it's their turn. Will they go in their sleep as they so desperately hope? Or will this earthly life end with some big medical crisis? We really don't have a whole lot of power over some of that, do we? So life, if you like, particularly later life, is a constant interplay between continuity and transformation. It's not just the zero-sum game, the loss or gain summary. Age doesn't really bring about radical discontinuities to life. We are still the same person that we always were, with the same values, the same personality traits, the same opinions, uh, the same feistiness and so on. We don't actually lose our er earlier selves. We actually only add to them. And this idea that we're leeching vitality all the time, that's a bit of a myth of ageing, that we're literally ebbing away uh, uh, in front of other people. The great philosopher Cicero knew that. He talked about the great affairs of life are not performed by physical strength or activity or nimbleness of body, but by deliberation, character, expression of opinion. And old age has them in greater degree you are far more likely to achieve more through strategy than through pure brawn. There's no upper age limit on curiosity or creativity. And in fact, we may really only learn how to learn as we grow older. There can be a joy in being. We can shed an awful lot of hang-ups. We can liberate ourselves from social expectation. And that can allow us to review life's meaning and working through a lot of conflicts and a lot of baggage that we may have accumulated over the years in terms of unresolved pain or conflicts or losses. And less, maybe more, and people often talk about later life as being quieter years, more sedentary years perhaps. Is that necessarily a bad thing? It may not be. Life may not so much shrink, but that the inessentials get sloughed off. You know, we don't have to spread ourselves so thinly. We can monotask rather than multitasking. So many people are stressed out of their minds multitasking. It can be quite uh, a hard challenge for human beings. But how wonderfully refreshing to do one thing at a time and to do something very, very well. Or indeed to learn to say no. There's no evidence also that we love less, that we're less passionate, you know, that we're less opinionated or that we love fewer people as we age, we can certainly still relish what we still have. So I want to turn to the new scientist and just to come to another article that I saw that, as you know, new scientist tries to squeeze in between that kind of popular science and more academic science. And they came up with some positive aging tips, which I wanted to share with you. And I'm just giving them to you directly. They talk about going for the burn that actually small doses of stressors, if you're doing a fast or if you're doing a bit of exercise, that that is actually good for the body, the so-called hormetic effect. You put the body under stress briefly and then you release the stress and that is supposed to be a good thing. New Scientist particularly talks about social interconnection and urges people not to, not to be isolated. People are interconnected, but so is their health. Consider relocation, according to the New Scientist. There are some longevity hotspots on the planet. There's Okinawa in Japan. There's a Caria in Greece. 
or we know places in Ukraine and Georgia and Central Europe where you do get quite a lot of concentrated centenarians in communities. Now, look, look let's be honest, you know, relocation is not terribly practical for, for a lot of us. We have to consider our own personal environment and how we can make it more health sustaining, more fulfilling, more appropriate to, to our needs. A new scientist urges you to exercise the grey cells in the mind and body gym. And if you have a if you have the advice, make a virtue out of it from time to time. You know, it's okay to have a, an odd shot of coffee or a bar of chocolate or a glass of wine, but obviously all in moderation. And I should add that uh, you all need to be aware about the Colleges of Physicians in the UK reducing the uh, alcohol, recommended alcohol weekly limits. I'm sure you're all aware of that. It is 14 units a week now. I never miss a chance to say this. 14 units a week now for men and women of all ages. And if you're 65, you can divide that by, by two. I'm sorry, I'm really raining on people's parade. So smile, the benefits of smiling. You know, having an innate positive attitude and displaying it externally, that can be very useful for decreasing stress. Nurture your inner hypochondriac. No, new scientists don't want to make you into a ball of anxiety. I think what they're saying about that is that there are certain key symptoms and signs that you really should pay attention to. And sometimes if you ignore, warning signals around your health, literally procrastination can be, uh, can be fatal. Uh, get a meaningful life. Lifelong learning is very, very important. Where is it written that we should stop learning at any stage in life? Um, I want to just share with you some general skills of well-being from uh, Rath and Harter, and they undertook, on behalf of Gallup, a very big survey of 150 countries across many, many cultures to really distill what are the elements of individual well-being. So they talk about career well-being, and again, we can't assume that older people will not be, will not be working and gainfully employed. So career well-being, the tips that they would give would be that we should really play to our strengths in the workplace. We should have a mentor, a role, in fact, that older workers are very suited for, and we should have social time with our colleagues in the workplace. That gets the most out of, out of workers. Social well-being, I found this statistic quite startling. Um, they would say that we need up to six hours of social time per day for our well-being. Now, that's quite a tall order, isn't it? But that can include interfacing with work colleagues, family. It can include email, technology time, and so on. Um, obviously, maintaining and building your social network is crucial. Mixing social and physical activity is a really, really good thing to do. What better way to have an interaction with someone that you walk and you talk with them at the same time? In terms of financial well-being, um, really what they're saying is that we should spend money on experiences. Now, I think you'll know this rather than items or things that we get more uh, memorable <coughs> recollections if we spend our money on maybe a, a holiday or a, a meal or whatever. Uh, spend on others. I think we know it's a cultural truism, a cultural truism, I should say, right across the world that in giving uh, we receive. And in particular, I think relevant for older people perhaps, they're talking about establishing default payments. In other words, direct debits systems so that it takes the kind of daily worry out of, uh, out of finances and financial organization. Physical well-being. So for younger adults, uh, this is the, the consensus. They're saying 20 minutes of physical activity per day. I think that's maybe you know, lower than I was expecting. Uh, sleep, we all know about the seven to eight hours. And shopping healthily, I like that suggestion that a lot of our health is actually put into our shopping trolley, okay? It's not so much at the moment at which we're putting it in our mouths, it's nearly too late. No, the strategy has to come in the supermarket. And community well-being, very relevant for older people as well. Contributing to your community, we are urged to do based on your personal mission, telling people about your passions, being the, the poster boy or girl for your cause or your project, and disclosing that, and opting into events where and when you can. Okay, just to talk then about social skills for older people and to follow, follow on, um, I think you'll agree that loneliness, and we, know, we now know this, that loneliness can be a very, very bad habit to drift into. We, it can be very, very bad for your health. Some people say it can be as bad as smoking 10 cigarettes a day for 30 years. And we know for men particularly, 
Um, in terms of you know, their health at age 80, you can predict their, their health at age 80 not by their blood glucose, not by their blood cholesterol, not by blood pressure, but basically by their relationship satisfaction, according to the 75-year Harvard study, which is uh, increasingly releasing data and information. So I think we really got to lean into our relationships. What is a good relationship? It's down to really one criterion. Can you count on such and such a person in a time of need? Obviously, do they accept you for who you are, warts and all? Do you see your completion in the other person? If you do, you have a pretty good relationship. And these relationships protect our brains, even if relationships can get messy occasionally, as they can. They are complex, long-term projects, are they not? And as we get older, we need to replace our workmates with playmates. That's basically what we need to do. We should do new things with our, with our partners. We should reach out. There may be family disputes that have dogged families for generations, that are even passed on from generation to generation. What about trying to resolve them and heal them? That can be a very, very fulfilling thing to do. And sometimes it takes the stability of later life and the wisdom to do that. And obviously there may be ground rules that are necessary to keep relationships al alive in terms of, for example, moratorium or curfews on technology. And have a range of relationships of varying ages. Older people may find this challenging, but it's very important that they have friendships with people of all ages because unfortunately people will find as they get older their social circle will dwindle through death and illness. And that needs to be actively replaced. It cannot be uh, left to chance. The skill of health. So health, I think we will agree, is the one thing that is a very, very significant predictor of the experience and quality of later life. The thing that a rich person cannot buy and a poor person should never sell. A couple of health messages. Starting exercise at any age is very important. It can be beneficial in terms of you know, preventing arthritis, uh, keeping our joints supple, reducing weight, reducing uh, things like diabetes, which are really epidemic at the moment. We need to realise that, in fact, up to a third of dementia may be preventable. And research, hard research is now pointing to that in terms of controlling vascular risk factors like blood pressure or controlling glucose or cholesterol levels and treating these things appropriately and actively. We mentioned about key red flag symptoms. So there are key red flag symptoms that we all need to be aware of. Things like rapid weight loss, bleeding or chest or abdominal pain. These things need to be checked out. They cannot be ignored. You do so at your peril. I think it's very important to build and construct a health support system for yourself. And that could be specialists, it could be your GP particularly, it could be the GP's receptionist or, or secretary or your pharmacist or your audi audiologist or your optician. Always, always maintain sensory functions in optimal uh, level of function. In terms of health, again, there are some myths around mental health which we should debunk at this point. The majority of people, even age 90 and over, do not have any evidence of dementia. And older pe people don't get depression by virtue of being old. Actually, community surveys will show that the vast majority of older people, even into their mid-80s, will rate quality of life as good. Some anxiety disorders actually decrease as we, as we get older. Some mental illnesses actually improve as we get older, particularly the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, for example. They may diminish in intensity as, as we get older. And older people may never suffer some mental illnesses like nomophobia, the fear of being out of phone contact. I think we can say that's a younger person's illness, if it's an illness at all. Now, the skill of movement. I want to just mention this man, um, Steve Jepson. Movement is very important because, as you know, um, what the health services can get very caught up with, particularly during the winter months, is slips, trips and falls. And falls for older people are far from trivial events. They can be very significant adverse health events. And you can Google this man or, or look him up on YouTube, Steve Jepson, and I would urge you to. He's quite something when you see him in action. He devised a, a program of movement called Never Leave the Playground. It's a wonderful title, which is a program of 
specific graded training of hands and feet to build hand-eye coordination, improve balance and stability and train body by these regime of exercises, akin to playing children's games in a, in a playground. And he starts with simple exercises, which obviously everyone should start with, and they become progressively uh, more complex. So the emphasis is on making movement enjoyable, improving physical fitness, but above all, I think what is very important, falls prevention. And obviously, the spin-off benefits, we know it's been proven beyond the need to research it anymore that exercise is good for our mood and brain plasticity through having this commitment to physical fitness and staving off inertia. So Steve Jepson, never leave the playground. Do look him up at some point. Now, the skill of the five force fields. Others who've written about old age, Richard Falk, who's quite an interesting character, I believe. He's um, been a human rights um, lawyer and he has been an ambassador in the United Nations and has been very critical of human rights abuses in the Middle East, I believe, during his, his entire career. He talks about the five force fields that we need to keep ac active in daily consciousness as we age. And they are love, health, play, work, and of course, caring for the future. We can never give up caring for the future. That is not just the business of the younger folk, that is everyone's business. We all have a responsibility to overcome the most intru annoying intrusions of aging. So if there is a bit of disability or pain or limitation of movement, we need to try and correct that, basically, vigorously correct it. And caring for the future is basically this unfinished citizen pilgrimage that we should all subscribe to, where we have old aspirations or unfinished business to create, as he calls it, the unattainable perhaps, but heavenly city here on earth. That's what life is about, is it not, for, for most of us. And Richard Falk with Mitch Anthony has coined the five C's that uh, we need to be mindful of as we age. They need to maintain connectivity, connections with people, challenges in our lives, to maintain curiosity and creativity, and of course, charity, which gives us great meaning in life. The skill of retirement. I want to turn to this now, really with a great health warning, I have to say. I am not in favour of compulsory retirement. I'll set out my stall straight away. Um, why? Because expectations of retirement, that it's going to be a time of relaxation, unlimited contentment, happiness, freedom. Those expectations, unfortunately, may not be met. They may come off the rails. Our assumptions may be wrong. We do need copious plan Bs if, for example, we're deciding to look for a rural little or to move away to Spain or whatever, that may work out for us. But I think having the odd plan B is, is prudent. A job can do a lot of things for us. Apart from income, apart from the fiscal compensation, there's status, there's a social network, there's self-esteem, there's a purpose, there's meaning and so on. But who will do the minding of us now when we leave our jobs, you know? All that energy we expend, all that effort we expend, may be to someone else's benefit or some other unit's benefit. And now we have to learn to think for ourselves, possibly for the first time in our lives. And we may discover a joy in being. We may discover a softer side to ourselves. I'm thinking of men who retire. But that nurturing instinct, for example, may come too late for some men whose families may long have fled the nest. So abolishing compulsory retirement. I'm certainly in favour of it um, because I think people should have a choice. My mother was dismissed from her job in the civil service when she got married. We would laugh at that now. We would see that as a gross infringement of human rights and a stunting of, of, of female participation in the workplace. But what about older people who still have significant things to give in a working environment? Compulsory retirement to me is a criminal waste of expertise and talent. Older workers embody a lot of things, not only experience, not only task experience, but also they may embody the culture of an organisation, the core value of an organisation. And organisations can be quite obsessed with change for the profit margins and the bottom line of shareholders, but that may be uh, very short term thinking indeed. So my view of retirement is that we should ease off. We should avoid, avoid that cliff face of retirement where on your 65th birthday you have uh, the, the carriage clock given to you or whatever token gift is presented to you 
and the well wishes. I'm not saying that that's not appropriate, but I think that cliff face can be certainly detrimental to people's health. So what about having an optional four-day week from 55, an optional three-day week from 60, with a compulsory review of your job description by a, a manager or a HR department so that you don't have to do the stuff you no longer want to do. You can do the stuff that you are good at. You can play to your skills and your strength. You shouldn't have to be subjected to enforced retraining. We know that one of the most cynical ways companies has a, have of getting rid of older workers is to introduce a new IT system. Quite a cynical move in a lot of cases. And if you want to continue working from 65 onwards, that should be your choice as long as you have the health and physical and intellectual commitment to do so. Or you can collect your entire pension uh, from 65. But workplaces must be more age friendly. They must be more age respectful. And employers should demonstrate that the work of, of older workers is still needed. And really workplaces should be a blend of younger workers and older workers to function really well. A skill of life, remain engaged. Older people need to remain productive and enthusiastic. You know the way we say, they should do something about that. Well, hang on a minute, they is actually you. Avoid over-analysis. It can sometimes kill happiness. And we need to aim for moments of bliss as we age that can obliterate countless hours of pain by remaining engaged, passionate, and enthusiastic. Try basically to become the person you'd like to spend the rest of your life with. So we can have a charter for action. We can resolve to make time to do the things I enjoy doing. That's what retirement is for after all. Bottom line, I will learn to relax and express my feelings. It is never too late to do this. And sometimes you can get away with a hell of a lot more as an older person. You can really speak your mind and get away with it. I will improve my skills to gain knowledge and confidence. We above all need change and challenge as we age. We do need a routine, but we also need variety and stimulation. I will learn to say no as I get older. It may be to inappropriate, unreasonable demands of adult children, for example. I will learn to delegate responsibility. As we get old, we may need assistance, particularly you know, according to our health circumstances, with personal care, for example. So try and see that as delegating responsibility when needed. What about the skill of admitting death? Old age has been deleted from death certificates in the US since 1951. You can't write natural causes on a death cert. It's illegal in the UK and the US. So what has been the effect of that? Death goes underground. It becomes medicalised. It's seen as unnatural and almost a personal failing. But by de-repressing death, we can reclaim the energy that goes into denial and old age can become no longer synonymous with death, but with living and life. If we actually compiled a life review from our birth, what year of death would we fill in? It would be a very interesting exercise. And then the second question is, what would you do with the remaining time that you have? It would be very illuminative. Um, the skill of awareness of this. I want to share with you a book that you may have heard about by Bronnie Ware called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And she was a lady who worked as a palliative care nurse, working with people who were in the last stages of life, very often through cancer or so, some other terminal condition. And she distilled it down to five insights, and they are these. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. How many men could say that? I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. I wish I'd allowed myself to be happier. So we need a strategy, and there is a skill in that, to foster flexibility and an openness to new experience, because that can help slow the passage of time. Have you ever been in a way in a strange place on holidays, and you've been there two days, and you say to yourself, my God, it seems as if I've been here a week. Time seems to go a little bit slowly when our senses are fired up, when we're truly mindful and paying attention to things. So we need change and challenge and new experience to help maybe within somewhat artificially slow down the passage of time. I think we need to be careful in later life about excessive nostalgia for the past. Um, everything can seem rosy in the past, and of course it wasn't. There were major hassles, 
major moments of awkwardness, anxiety, when we tried to forge an identity, forge a career. We were very insecure, perhaps, in the past. So we need to be realistic about that. But we can do a review of our lives and document it. We can document insights and wisdom that we want to pass on to the next generation. We need to guard our independence carefully. We still have much to contribute and the world needs experience, but we can't bristle too much perhaps if the world is unintentionally patronising. Sometimes people want to help, but they step in too prematurely and may de-skill older people. And in health services, we're notorious, unfortunately, at doing that. We need to actively seek compensations for loss of function, particularly. And I think if we're looking ahead, I prefer to look ahead in three-year chunks. So set goals into a three-year plan. That can be a very good idea. Looking too far beyond that can be you know, quite uncertain and a bit catastrophic. What about the skill set of wisdom? If we think about development in later life, this is the one attribute we will associate with older people. And certainly the Berkeley Guidance Study in the 1960s showed that wisdom had a stronger influence on life satisfaction than socioeconomic status, than the amount of income you have. So what is wisdom? Wisdom is a, an advanced form of knowledge achieved through learning from life's challenges and opportunity. And certainly by doing a life review, maybe in written form or in verbal form with a therapist, for example, that will certainly cultivate wisdom. And Eric Erickson was big into wisdom. He felt, in fact, in retrospect, that a ninth stage of, of the life cycle was needed to face down uh, despair and embrace acceptance. But wisdom certainly implies knowing life's uh, uncertainties and unknowns and being comfortable with them being less dogmatic perhaps, and letting, letting uh, those uncertainties not eke at us so much. I just want to mention briefly the Evergreen programme that we run in this hospital. Some people in this room, I'm pleased to say, have and are participating in it. And this is a psychoeducational group programme delivered by multiple disciplines on Vanessa Ward, which is now a dedicated inpatient unit for older people here in St. Patrick's Hospital. And you can see the topics that we cover, ranging from loss and negative stereotypes, wellness lifestyle, improving memory, using medication safely, and understanding common health risks, for example, through falls prevention. But I want to highlight other things that we've added in, which have been enormously popular, including pet therapy, Tai Chi, and we really didn't think this would be taken up very enthusiastically, but it has been, and computer use. We do this at ward level and even a seated exercise group, so you don't have to get on that bike or walk two or three miles to get aerobically, aerobically fit. So I just want to show to you that there is a practical translation of some of these principles into a, a form of treatment that is delivered in this hospital. Okay, we're coming to the end. I want to talk a little bit about skilled agers and role models of ageing. I think we need role models at every stage in life, and we talk about how important they are for a younger generation. Um, and role models of active ageing, I think, should be celebrated particularly for continuity. And for remaining, people who are remaining productive and talented, not necessarily people who are outrageous or eccentric. And I'm thinking of the programme 50 Ways to Kill Your Mammy, where Baz's mother is being shot at or being pushed out of a plane in a parachute. And you see that, that, treat, that uh, awful treatment that she's subjected to, which she, she seems to relish and, and, and love. So what about people who are basically talented and who remain talented into very late life? I'm thinking of Michelangelo, who painted the Sistine Chapel ceiling until he was 89. Or Nelson Mandela, who began his political career in his 70s. Dr. Michael DeBakey was a famous US cardiac surgeon who practiced medicine for almost 75 years. Bill Clinton gave him to Boris Yeltsin to do his bypass operation in the early 1990s. Pierre Monteau was invited to become the London Symphony Orchestra's principal conductor at 86, but only accepted when he was given a 25-year contract. <laughs> now there's optimism for you. Alex Ferguson, what about Alex? He was the personification of a person in his 70s, remaining in control despite a high-pressure job. His successors haven't done terribly well. Now you'll have your own idea of role models and people that you will associate with who are, who are particularly very good examples of active ageing. And a Guardian survey, the UK newspaper, The Guardian, looked at role models such as the Queen Elizabeth, David Attenborough, Billy Connolly, 
Joan Bakewell, Tony Benn, and the Rolling Stones as being commendable role models for seniors. Who's the person in the, on the left there? Or M, as they say in James Bond. And by God, when she said, kill him, 007 did as he was told. So in summary, ageing, I would like to say, is a, an accelerated series of opportunities to gain psychological and spiritual maturity, remaining engaged in as many aspect of life, aspects of life as a priority. Pos positive behavioural habits, particularly in terms of diet and exercise and use of skills, reduce disability and improve quality of life. Wisdom, self-acceptance and dispositional optimism have positive effects in health and survival. And social ties are essential for well-being and satisfaction in later life. There are some bonuses from some of the natural frailties that may emerge in later life. During a long and boring speech from one of the many less inspiring MPs, Winston Churchill spotted an older member of Parliament straining with an ear trumpet to hear what was being said and demanded loudly, who is that fool denying his natural advantages? <laughs> so sometimes a bit of deafness can be, can be helpful. A preacher visited an older woman from his congregation and as he sat on the couch he noticed a large bowl of peanuts on the coffee table. Mind if I have a few, he asked. No, not at all, the woman replied. They chatted for an hour and as the preacher stood to leave, he realised that instead of eating just a few, he'd virtually emptied the entire bowl. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, I really just meant to eat a few, the preacher said apologetically. Oh, that's all right, the woman said with a twinkle in her eye. Ever since I lost my teeth, all I can do is suck the chocolate off them. <laughs> Serves them right, the manners. This life is an adventure. I love what we do. The day before I die, I want a painting half finished on the easel. The day I die, I want to yearn to finish it. John Burke, artist. I can't let this moment pass up by trying maybe to guide some of the discussion for the next few minutes. I want to ask you a couple of questions. Where will we learn the skill sets I've described? Will we learn them in the classroom? Will we learn them in the workplace? Should people have pre-retirement courses that go on a month instead of the cursory half day or day that they're given at the moment? Will we learn them in the parish hall or maybe in a university for older people? How can society value older people more? For example, volunteering opportunities, part-time working, mentoring programmes or leadership programmes for older people who have talent in abundance but are who are outside a system, who are not part of a, a club but could join that and contribute hugely. And what are the biggest priorities and challenges for older people in society currently? Thank you very much for your attention and I'd be very grateful to hear your views on some of those points. <laughs>